she has been at Dartmouth since about 2006, where she's now a full professor, um, and has been kind of exploring really fun areas of um, social psychology and social neuroscience. And a lot of like what her, her work has been building towards is like how we um, like interacting minds and how we can study dynamics between people. Um, and then also, I think one thing that's really nice about her is that she's won many um, teaching and mentoring awards over the years, which I think is very admirable and exciting and speaks to Thank the you. type of work she does and the relationship she has with students. So, thanks, Luke. let's get started. Okay, great. Uh, thanks for having me. Nice to be at Mind again. Uh, it's my favorite, obviously, um, social workshop. Uh, so. I am going to be talking about mapping social behavior. I've never given a talk about mapping before, so it was uh, it was an interesting uh, way of framing my research, and hopefully you'll agree that this is, I think it's actually a very useful way, so I'm, I'm very uh, thankful to ha having to have the exercise to do it. So I'm gonna talk about how my research looks at sort of social maps. Um, and and uh, before I get started, I wanna thank uh, the people past and present in my lab, um, some of uh, whom are here today. So you recognize Carolyn. Carolyn's um, going to come up in a little bit. So I'm not going to talk a, a lot about her work. She's going to do that. Um, and let's see. I uh, also want to mention that um, I collaborate with Uri Hassan on some of the neuroscience that you'll see. Um, and that there's room for, uh, uh, in terms of that R01, there's room for a postdoc if you're interested in doing another postdoc or a later postdoc, or if you're in graduate school now, do, doing a postdoc after you graduate your, your PhD, let me know. And this morning, because I was sort of punchy and sleep deprived, I noticed that I've had this slide for a while, and that black box looks a little bit like the Black Knight from Holy Grail, <laughs> which would be awesome to have in the lab, I think. Um, but, or you is good too. So um, mainly we're concentrating uh, today's talk on uh, these people's work. Um, so uh, Bo Sievers, who just graduated recently, is now a postdoc at Harvard. Um, Adrian Wood uh, was a postdoc, and now she's an assistant professor at UVA. And Emma, Sophie, and Chris are in the room. Can you raise your hands? Thank you. OK. They're current uh, members of the lab. Um, and Adam Box is a uh, a postdoc in Hungary that works also on the hyperscanning stuff that I'll talk about a little bit. All right. So what does it mean to map social behavior? Um, this is, was sort of my task, uh, knowing that I was going to give a talk at this cognitive maps mind. Um, so what does it mean? Well, one way to think about mapping social behavior is just sort of the physical space that we occupy and how we occupy that physical space with each other. Right, so this is uh, a picture, it's hard to see, of an overhead shot of people at a, at a mixer, a, a party, an orientation party. So they're all kind of moving around each other in space. And you can very simply think about social behavior as that, moving in space. I want to talk to Megan, but she's too far away. But you can also think about it in terms of how, the, the, how we bifurcate the space with each other, um, whether uh, people are sort of close talkers, or they seem kind of sort of distant physically. Um, people as attractors in this space, right? People who are, have a sort of gravitational pull, there's always sort of a throng around them. People who repel other people, right? You can imagine these scenarios playing out. Um, and, and also you can think about sort of social foraging, right? So um, people that kind of uh, flit around as social butterflies, sort of like um, you think bees on uh, collecting pollen on different sort of flower patches and they just kind of flit around. Other people just sort of glom onto a single person and stay there the entire time. That's sort of my sort of model. You can think of this, this mapping on a little bit to introversion and extroversion. Um, but the ways different people have different ways of um, using the physical space in terms of their sociality. Uh, but you can also think not so much in terms of physical space when you think about social behavior, but um, kind of mental space, for lack of a better word, or thought space. And Jeremy Manning, I'm sure, has talked about this uh, already at Mind a bit. 
OK, cool. All right. Um, so like your thoughts sort of wander around. Um, you, can, you can be in a conversation and think, how did we end up in this weird part of the space? Like, why are we talking about how do we get here? And you sort of trace back how the conversation evolved to put you in this uh, part of the space. Um, somebody can take a left turn. You don't really know it wasn't what you were expecting. Um, and conversation can just stay on track. Right? or it can be all over the place. These are, we're using spatial words here because I think they, they describe how conversation moves. Um, okay, but wait. If anything that moves over time can be mapped, then aren't maps just the way the brain works, right? Am I saying anything profound here? And this is a th thing I struggled with at 6 o'clock this morning, is uh, <laughs> I found this diagram of Nick or Q. Like, is this profound or obvious, right? This is just movement over time that can be graphed spatially because it can and therefore everything in, in the physical world that isn't a dynamic world is can be thought of in terms of a map right so is it profound or obvious yes is the answer <laughs> right it's both um, because space and time collapse at some level um, and that's all I'm gonna say that's my little hand wavy graphic um, talk to a physicist about space-time loaf, whatever, it, it collapses. This is the one thing that I've done in this area that, to illustrate space and time collapsing. And this is actually from Carolyn's work, so I'm just going to very quickly mention some work that was done um, uh, a few uh, years ago now. So in this, uh, in this study that Carolyn did, uh, people are lying in a magnet and they're looking at uh, objects uh, so they're looking at photographs of objects, and the object that's a spoon is either f is far away at, at first, but then the next image it's closer, and so you get this sort of apparent motion kind of a thing sort of, but you're basically, is this closer, your task is, is this closer now than it was previously? Um, is B closer than A, right? That's the, that's the task that you're doing in the magnet, but there's also temporal distance trials. So you get things like, in a few seconds, a month from now, is B later or sooner than A? Um, and you get used to how this works. And there's social distance trials, too. So people are lying in there, and they see pictures of their friends that they've given us, or pictures of people that they know um, but aren't really friends with. They're just sort of acquaintances that they run into a lot. Um, and uh, is this person more familiar or less familiar? And the question that we wanted to uh, answer here was if you if you trained a computer to recognize brain patterns associated with um, traveling in physical space can you decode the trials that are traveling in time or traveling in social distance right if a computer is, is understands that this is comes nearer and that is comes further um, can they tell when when you go from acquaintance to friend or friend to acquaintance and what we found is that yes you can in inferior parietal lobe, uh, which is an area associated with egocentric um, spatial distance encoding, um, you get a similar pattern for near objects that come near, uh, time that shrinks closer, and uh, when you see a friend versus an acquaintance. Um, and that uh, those patterns are similar, and one could be decoded from the other, um, and in contrast to this set. So, Time, space, social, these are all on the same map, basically. It's how the brain tracks information over time, right? It's just how our minds have solved the problem of keeping track of information. Okay, so my domain is the social world, so I'm going to show you how maps play out in, in that domain. Um, and social psychology and social neuroscience are just starting to study behavior in this way, in the way that um, looks more like a dynamic map. So how might we map social behavior? Well, just to go back to the slide before, I think you can, you can think of people's social behavior in terms of physical space, and you can think of it in terms of how we travel in space together in our heads. And I'm going to talk to you about some work I've been doing on, for both of those uh, areas of the space. So movement in physical space. This is the way we're doing it. All of this stuff from here on out is unpublished, various levels of preliminary status. Okay. All right. Um, so here's a, this is, uh, the color's all kind of funky um, because we're attempting to hide people's identities, but um, 
basically it's a it's a it's a party. Uh, this is the incoming business school class of last year, and we've hoisted up. Chris, how many cameras in the ceiling? Okay, and Chris at 7.30 this morning was doing exactly that because we're doing a replication. Right? We wanna make sure that we know what we have. Um, so what we get is uh, this huge, uh, so there's all these different perspectives of these different cameras and we have um, somewhere between 100 and 200 people in this space talking to each other, moving around from conversation to conversation. And um, it's actually quite challenging to get a computer to track people over time, it turns out. Um, so we're still trying to work on um, the software that enables uh, this, um, which we will share, obviously, when we get it working. But we can do things like identify who every person is, and uh, we can follow them over time. We can see what groups, what conversation groups they uh, they spend their time in and how those conversation groups are split up and over time. Here's, if you, you can just, maybe easier to see if you just get rid of the people and you just turn people into dots and you can start to see that um, people split off and conversations stay stable for a while and then they kind of disperse. If they get too large, they disperse and that sort of thing. Um, and you can, with this kind of data, you can you can see interesting things, right? You can see, um, this isn't very interesting, but bear with me. Uh, this is just um, number of conversations in the room over time. So it turns out that there's you know, some 20 to 30 conversations going on in the room at the beginning of this thing. And then over time, people sort of dwindle away. Um, but interestingly, if you look at the average conversation size, it's just flat, right? Average con conversation is always four people, basically, give or take one. Um, and if they get bigger than that, they split, right? There's some optimized number, and it doesn't matter how many people are in the room, and eventually it goes down to one little four-person group, and then it's over, okay? You can also look in, and you see things like um, how many individuals on average do people uh, uh, talk to? Uh, how many conversations do they have? Um, and you can see that it's, it's really skewed. A lot of people just wanna talk to one person, and then they're done. Um, some people talk to two, um, but it's interesting that there's variability here. And so what question, the questions that we want to answer with this kind of data, this kind of movement tracking data, is um, whether or not anything about how people move when they're just getting to know each other, right? So this is the first time they're socializing with each other. How they move in this situation, does it predict at all what their actual social map looks like, i.e. their social network properties? later once that network has stabilized, right? So we've, we've got this, we've got several months later what they're, how they actually became connected over time, who they were friends with, whether they were social hubs and that sort of thing. And is there anything in this that predicts that? Um, so for example, one thing that you could look at or that we're going to look at is something um, called eigenvector centrality. Has that been covered yet? Okay, all right, uh, eigenvector centrality is simply um, how well-connected one person is to well-connected others. All right, this is a me basically a measure of popularity, and um, if you looked at this sort of network, these people that are in the warmer colors are super well-connected because there's, they have high eigenvector centrality because they are well-connected to people who themselves are well-connected. They sort of form this kind of hub. And another way to think about this is uh, page rank algorithm. So um, Google uses a page rank algorithm to um, make sure that if you Google what is conversation, you don't get my web page, even though conversation's on it. You'll get uh, Wikipedia or uh, an op-ed from the New York Times or something that other people uh, are linking to. And it's a measure of um, how well connected these pages are to themselves, pages that are well connected, right? And those get elevated in the rank, and that's who, what you see first, right? Okay, well, that is an algorithm that gives you eigenvector centrality, how popular a, a web page is. Can you do that? This is a little bit uncomfortable to think about. Can you do that in, as a social map? Can you, in fact, page rank people this is where uh, ugh, it gets, I need to figure out the language to use that doesn't sound so gross. 
but can you, can you look at people in terms of, and these are actually color-coded by their page rank, in terms of uh, who's well-connected to well-connected others. In this case, who's talking to the people that everybody else is talking to, right? It's a kind of a measure of popularity in a real mathematical sort of sense. So, and does your page rank at a stranger sort of party um, in fact give you, oops, sorry, give you uh, this uh, um, uh, a measure or prediction of how central you will become in that network later on, right? Okay, and another way to think about networks is something called brokerage. Uh, so brokerage is, um, there are people here that are brokers that connect people who otherwise wouldn't be connected. So if you were in high school, if you had groups of friends that didn't really talk to each other, but you kind of flitted around between them. So you had your musician friends and your baseball team and this and that, but they weren't really connected other than through you. Like you're the sort of cross-pollinator. Um, th then you would be a broker, right? So there are people in the network who ser serve this role of brokers, and brokers are incredibly important in a network because they are the source of inf new information, right? Because they cross-pollinate. They also bring disease but in a positive sense, information. Okay, so one way to think about the, the social map here is what is going on with this tail and are, do these people, the people, I mean this person has eight conversations, um, do these people end up becoming brokers, right? The social butterflies in a mixer with strangers, do they end up brokering a network later? We don't know, but we're gonna find out. Um, and so we're, we, have, we have filmed people as they meet for the first time last year. We are doing it again tomorrow um, when, in this class. Um, and, uh, and then both of these groups of strangers actually are gonna have a mixer in the spring. We will film that too. And therefore we will be able to see, um, is there a better predictor? Do, do we get some information from when they're strangers, how they then uh, connect to each other in a network? Or is it better to understand how friend, once people know each other, that behavior, what, it, does that behavior better predict the way they sort of connect with each other in a network? Um, but these are the kinds of things that we can start, questions we can start to ask when we have this real data to work with. All right, so that's all I'm gonna say about actually mapping people moving in physical space. Now I'd like to talk about movement in mental space, but it's the same sort of idea. And I'm gonna, uh, when I think about people moving together in mental space, that really is conversation. Right? Because that is the way we transfer thoughts and align uh, together, um, is conversation. So, and not only can uh, you think of conversation as uh, almost a dance of two minds in space, um, but the conversation also can move those minds closer together, right? And, and by that I mean align our mental maps, our mental models of the world. <clears throat> so this is a study done by uh, Bo Sievers. And in this study, uh, the first thing people do is they come in and they are scanned, fMRI, while they're watching these uh, weird little five minute clips um, where the sound's off and people, there are obviously social relationships happening, but you don't really know what's going on. So I'm gonna give you a, like a 30 second clip of one of these. Okay. So what's going on there? Why did, the, why did the boy fall to the floor? Why did the Nicole Kidman character not seem to care? What's happening, right? All right, everybody sees these clips. They don't know what's going on. They're just watching them. Then uh, they get together in groups. Uh, so they've all done this, and now they get together, and they are reminded um, about the movie clips. And we also actually ask them what they thought was going on before they start talking, so we have a baseline. Then they start talking and their job is to come to some consensus interpretation. So, okay, let's agree, all right, this kid is reincarnated, is actually an adult that's been reincarnated as a kid 
and Nicole Kidman is uh, his daughter. Like that's actually is the movie. Nobody came up with that, but that is the uh, interpretation, the correct interpretation. All right, people come up with a various uh, interpretation of what's going on. Then in the third session, they see them again. Right, but now they're seeing them through the lens of the group interpretation. Okay, and they see not only these clips, but they see clips taken from later on in the film, same characters, but they've never seen these clips before. So the, the question is whether or not uh, that sort of common lens that they achieved for these clips, whether they will uh, persist in how you view the uh, following clips. And the, the basic result here is that conversation synchronizes brain activity within groups, right? It's what you would predict. If people are coming to a consensus view, and it, they're not just providing lip service, they actually do come to see it that way, that you can start to see this alignment. And the way, uh, the way we did it was very simple. The most simple from my analysis you can do was intersubject correlation. Um, so how, uh, and, and making these sort of change maps. So how correlated are people prior to uh, getting a consensus interpretation? So at the, be the beginning, you've got your own sort of interpretation. How synchronized are you with other people who are seeing these clips for the first time? Versus now you've had this conversation with each other where you've come to a consensus interpretation. Are you more in sync the second time uh, you see the clips? And we find that we get this increased synchrony. But importantly, it's context and content dependent. So here's, for example, one group. Um, and this is like several different movies. So the, green, the bright green yellow colors are the areas of the brain that came into greater alignment after conversation. And different regions are coming into greater alignment for different movies because they're different interpretations, right? There is no single brain area that's like the alignment region or the interpretation region. It's if you start to think of, you know, thing X in the same way, then the brain area that supports that concept will become more synchronized, right? But it, that concept might be completely different in, uh, for a different movie. And so it depends on what you're talking about as how you come into alignment. And even the same exact movie, uh, different groups come into alignment in different ways because their interpretations are different. I mean, in some ways, it has to be the case that if you are seeing these guys as brothers, that is different. That's going to require different activity than if you see them as strangers, for example. It's going to predict different things about how you view their actions going forward. It's going to predict different ways of attending to the space. This is actually important for one group. This, that he put the letter in the desk was important for one group, but it wasn't important for another group. And so they're differentially attending to these things, and so on and so forth. So people come into alignment, and it's, it's what they're aligning on that makes the difference in where they come to alignment. But the basic finding is that you get closer uh, uh, neural activity after conversation. Right? So here's just one cluster that Bo grabbed um, just to illustrate this. So you get these are the time, this is time series data for all of the six people, I think, in this group. Before conversation, there's a lot of idiosyncrasies about how they're watching this film over time. And then after conversation, everything gets sort of tighter. And you can, in fact, uh, quantify uh, the change in intersubject correlation. It goes all the way up to like 0.8 uh, change. Right? They go from being like completely uncorrelated, basically, to being fully correlated. And you can see, and, but it doesn't, that kind of dramatic change doesn't happen uh, you know, just all across the movie. It happens at pivotal moments. Like you can see where you get the, the biggest sort of change in people really coming together. Um, and then you can go back to the movie and see when that happens. And for that, these little peaks at the end, this is when he falls to the floor, right? This means something particular to each individual group now. OK. And you can start, because we took these conversation groups, uh, not just from random subjects, but actually from the business school population, which we had network data on, we can start to see more 
interesting things in a way about how people come into alignment. So does it matter, do people align more to you if you're a social hub in your natural social network? Um, are the, is, does it predict anything? Does, does, your, does your social influence predict anything about your sort of sway on a conversation? Um, and to look at this, we computed, we actually collapsed these two, these are two measures of centrality, social influence. And we did a PCA, and we're just calling it centrality for the ease of the first pass we're doing on this. Um, and you can look, this is the network and the size of the, those are, the red ones are our subjects and the size of their circle is how uh, central they are in the network. And you can see whether the size basically of the circle predicts their pull on a conversation, their pull on other people's brain states. So can you move someone else's mind to your own? Um, and that we call now a pull map. Basically, it's how much does an individual's mind change and become more like your original position. Okay, so how much are you pulling people to you and you're staying where you are? So one obvious question is do highly central people in network exert, exert pull on others' mental states disproportionately? That's what actually we predicted would happen. And there was some, a little tiny bit of evidence, a little, see the little tiny green patches? That's where you actually do in fact get like highly central people sort of uh, having an outsized pull on other people's um, mental states. But what we found that it's much more dramatic was that highly central people tended to actually be pulled more by the people around them. They were actually more likely to change uh, their original state to the, to the groups. Uh, so they have extra cognitive flexibility, if you will, or they're willing to listen and adapt their views. We're not sure exactly why, but that's what we found. So in summary of this, for this study, people's brains become more synchronized up to conversation. Importantly, that localization of synchrony is context and content dependent. Um, and highly central people are more likely to adapt their neural patterns to others in the group. All right. Now, importantly, this is the caveat here is our task was about building consensus, and it was low stakes. So you can imagine if you're a highly central person, um, why would you waste your social capital trying to sort of dig your heels in and make people move to you? Right? This is a low stakes task. The, the goal is consensus. So why not just go with the best idea out there? Right? That would make people feel good. It would, it would reflect well on your judgment. You would build social capital that way. You could imagine that this doesn't hold necessarily true if uh, people really care about the position that they're starting from and that other people come to them, their views on climate change, for example. Um, or whether it's set up to be a competitive conflict kind of situation. So this only holds in the case of consensus, that conversation can align minds under those conditions. All right. But basically, that all collapses to this idea of conversation is essentially neurofeedback. Right? We're, getting, we're interacting with each other to uh, get a sense of um, how things can adapt, how our thoughts can adapt, and what, where the sort of bounds of the space are. And we're constantly updating our social maps based on that um, feedback. So conversation gives us all of these things. That's why we do it all the time. That's why you will engage in many conversations today as you do every single day of your life. Because conversation gives us all of these things. Right? We exchange information. It's language, is, the conversation is the ecological niche of language use, right? It is why we have language, is to share ideas across minds and to uh, afford sort of this massive social coordination, right? That's, we're a social species and language is, is inherent in, in our sociality, right? Because it gives us all these things. The mystery then is why our studies uh, look like this. Right? All of our studies um, look like this. Uh, individual subjects, in fact, when I was a graduate student and it was like right in the thick of the cognitive revolution in social psychology, it was like, as an experimenter, um, you didn't even want like, to like touch or talk to the subject in any way, because that might bias the subject, right? So you bring in someone for an experiment and you just kind of basically shove them in a cubicle and say, hit play and you'll get the instructions 
right? It's like the most devoid, weird kind of atmosphere in, in relationship to what we, in fact, how we actually live our lives. And what, what's weirder about this is that if people actually, if you made people live like this, they would get really weird, right? They would get deeply, deeply weird. And this is, um, this is a guy who's been in solitary confinement for a couple of weeks, and this is what he said in an interview. How do I explain to a person that just standing in an empty dark room hurts? It's like this mental, you get confused. I would wake up and not remember what I was. You know how you get that feeling when a word is on the tip of your tongue? Well, that happened to me, only it was like, what am I? And then he goes on to talk about how it wasn't that he forgot who he was. It was that he couldn't work out if he was like an animal or a human or an energy or something. Like it, things got really weird after two weeks of not talking to anybody. And survivor spouses, these are spouses that, you know, they've been together for 60 something years and then one of them dies. And the, the, the survivor, their risk of death is increased dramatically in the period of time following the, their spouse's death, right? Um, and it's this idea that you're, when you're with someone for that long and that person is your social life, right? You become this coupled system. That's how your brain works. It's part of, uh, it's a unit, it's a single unit of two minds connected. And that's your social self-regulation coupled system. And when half of it is missing, you don't know where the what the structure should look like. And so you, you, there's, you get model drift and uh, things get really bad, right? So we need regular conversation to keep our mental maps oriented correctly without drift. And this is a slide I've, I've never shown before, but um, this is an, I had this conversation with this woman, Laurel Gabbard Dunham, and I can't remember where she is now. She was a Harvard postdoc at the time, and she was up here and giving a talk. And she told me about this, um, something I just can't, my mind can't let go of, because I think it's really, really profound. And it's the idea that uh, we all know that there are sensitive periods in development. And this is a map I got when I Googled sensory periods in development. Okay. So, but this is wrong. And, and she told me why it's wrong. So it, it isn't like there's a sensory period and then you go back and then it's locked in and there's no more plasticity. It doesn't work that way. There is no locking in. Um, and you know this because if someone gets, uh, if someone has a, injury and they become deaf later in life. So they, they uh, were not deaf before and they talked perfectly normally um, and then they become deaf. Their language, the way they speak, eventually kind of gets a bit garbled. It gets a bit hard to understand. Um, and so that tells you that things aren't locked down, right? Um, it tells you that the brain continually so it may be sparsely, but continually samples the space, samples the structure in the space, and basically, as a check, is the structure the same as I thought? Good, we're, we're fine. Is the structure the same? Good, we're fine, right? And when you get noisy inputs, then you're basically checking in and getting noise and going, oh no, the structure has changed. I need to adapt and learn the new structure. And that's when things get wrong, right? I think conversation is checking in with the social structure, right? And it's something we have to do frequently, otherwise we get off and things get garbled um, and strange. So we need to make frequent interactive contact with the map. All right, the question is, but how? All right, and I think the way we do it is through this idea of dynamic mutual adaptation. All right, so here's a, just a video of Dynamic mutual adaptation with metronomes. This is actually, uh, Uri is gonna put these metronomes on these um, metal cylinders, which allow them to kind of provide feedback, talk to, if you will, each other. All right, so once they're allowed to provide feedback to each other, they adjust and they become in sync. I think this is 
I mean, maybe it's too cute of a metaphor, but I think basically that's what's happening with social interaction and conversation. Here's another study that uh, looks at this just with very physical uh, finger tapping. This study by Kamblinka came out several years ago now, where two people are tapping, they're, they're told to tap together. They're in separate booths. They're told that they have to tap together. It's like every half second. Um, and they start off where they, they're listening in their headphones to eight tones, eight beats, right? And they have to tap to those beats. And then they have to keep going. OK, once the beats stop, they keep going. All right, there are diverse conditions. One is they both hear the initial eight beats, but then they don't hear each other. So they just get the initial eight beats, and then they just hear themselves tap. And very quickly, they sort of drift apart. They can't keep the timing, the beat, correctly. In condition two, both hear the rhythm, but then only one person hears the other person. It isn't bidirectional. And what you get is a leader-follower dynamic, where um, the person who's hearing the other person basically sort of synchronizes but follows the other person. So they do better, but in this very specific direction. Um, and then the best condition is when they both hear the rhythm, and then they can hear each other. And what you get is this micro-adaptation um, like, oh, I was a little bit too soon, oh, I was a little bit too, and, they, and at trial by trial, they get, they, they keep um, on track and they get b the best synchrony. All right, so I think this is a way to think about conversation and um, mutually adapting uh, to mental space uh, in a social context. So here's some behavioral data we have of maybe this kind of way of thinking about conversation as two people moving together in space. All right. This uh, has required uh, using tools that are at least new to social psychology and social neuroscience. Um, specifically, what I'm going to show you is using natural language processing, topic modeling, and its work with Emma Templeton and Luke Chang. Um, and it's a, I think, quantum leap better than what basically we've been doing, which is the study of conversation has been stuck in this very static, non-mappy uh, kind of world. Um, and because we haven't had the tools, frankly. Um, so this is, this is conversation, um, conversation psychology 1.0 was your, your, your significant other comes home, honey, I'm home. You say, how was your day? Person starts talking and you stop them and you direct them to a Likert scale um, about how satisfied they are with their overall well-being, right? That's, we can't deal with words and or, there's just too messy, too much richness. So we have to reduce it to a six on a seven point scale. We can do better now. Um, and uh, as I said before, this is work with uh, Emma and Luke. Um, we basically just have people come in to, and have conversations. Lots and lots of conversations. So, uh, and we do these round robin designs where every participant has um, multiple conversations. And so we can uh, collect, so every round robin has like 55 conversations. And you can start to see, because people are all talking to each other at different times, you can start to see whether certain people are more enjoyable to talk to than other people. Like how, is there something that, you, do you have a conversational style that follows you around? Um, and so you can ask things like, how much did you enjoy the conversation? And you can get, this is like one person talking to their partner. And the way to read this is that when people talk to partner seven, so this is a scale of how much people enjoy the conversation with dark blue colors, meaning they didn't enjoy it. And not a lot of people like talking to partner seven. That's pretty consistent. And that's in comparison to partner 10 that everybody kind of enjoys talking to. So that's interesting. That's information. So what is it about these conversations that are so uh, appealing or unappealing? Um, we've collected a lot of data now. This isn't even all of it. This is just a, this is now a kind of an old, older slide. Um, and, and Emma's collected uh, data with, with close friends. But these are all strangers um, that I'll be talking about. Now, how do you start to map out conversation? Um, well, you have to turn, and this is why it hasn't been done very often, you have to turn like this sort of stuff into a kind of a map. Um, in a way that's scalable and data-driven, which has been challenging, um, but you can do it. So the first thing to do is train a model to basically define how do people who tend to use words. Right? So the way we, uh, these are Dartmouth students coming in and talking a lot about Dartmouth lingo, et cetera. So um, we found that the best model um, that helped us understand how people move in their conversation space with this population was to train a model 
on uh, Dartmouth, articles from the Dartmouth newspaper. All right. Then you can validate that model um, by saying, okay, well, how well uh, does it differentiate topics uh, in, a, in, a different, um, at a, in a different source? So here we have Wikipedia pages on things that kind of come up in these conversations. And for each page, divide it into four chunks. And you basically say, OK, can the model tell that all of these pages, all of these chunks came from the same page, the same topic, right, versus other topics? And so in a perfect world, um, the model would, the computer would go, OK, these are all computer science uh, pages, um, and those are distinct from the football pages that hang together, and so on, so on, so on. Um, and it does pretty well. This is Emma's uh, validation. The, the only sort of off-diagonal thing is the computer science and neuroscience confusion. But yeah, we think that's forgivable. All right. And then, so you have a working model that you validated on different data, and you apply that model to the actual conversation. And then you can start to map it in the space that you've created. All right. So importantly, every step in this process is independent of each other. So I'm going to, so this is obviously multidimensional, high dimensional space, but we're going to, because I can't graph that, I'm going to show you a map that's two dimensional. Um, so this is, this box is the topic space. Um, and using a convention that uh, I believe Jeremy, uh, you figured out to do the, the rainbow, which is brilliant. The, okay, so I believe that this, I'm going to give credit where credit is due, I hope. Um, so we've now we've colored. This is a conversation in space, and uh, the, we're color coding it as Jeremy's convention. Red is the start, and uh, indigo is the end. So you know how it kind of moves through the space, right? That's the first speech turn. That's the last speech turn. Um, the size of the circles is information in terms of how long they stay in that space. Um, and by mapping things out this way, you can start to see interesting properties of conversation that were opaque before we could do things like topic modeling. For example, you can start to see, like, do conversations use a lot of space? Are they ping-ponging around all over the topic space? Or do they use relatively little space? Do they use recursion? Do they cycle back to topics, call back to previous things they've said? Um, you can look at that because with the with the rainbow, you can see when, you know, when red is overlapping on indigo, they've circled all the way back to what they originally started. And some topics don't re use recursion at all. They just sort of linearly go blah, 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 forward and never, it never sort of recycle previous topics. You can start to see the number of nodes that you revisit, uh, in a, uh, that you visit in a conversation. Um, do like 65 different topics versus 25. You could start to map these back on to things like how much people enjoyed um, talking to that person. And this person's conversation, where everybody enjoys talking to that person, tend to look like that, which is different than the person nobody likes to talk to. And you can put these side by side, and you start to look. There are differences. There's more exploratory behavior here. I'm not going to make too much of this. I think exploratory conversations could be really fun, potentially. Um, but you can start to see people have different conversational styles. Um, these have real impact in how much people enjoy a conversation. Um, you can also uh, look to see how people um, move together in topic space and ask questions like, do the shapes of conversation predict enjoyment? Do they predict clinical outcomes if in a clinical setting? Um, do people tend to move through this topic space across all of their conversations, or do they change depending on their partner? Do people prefer talking to people who like to move in the same way that they do? I don't have answers to any of these questions, but I'm just showing you <laughs> that this is something we can do now. Right? We can look at the angles of things. We can look at the number of nodes. We can look at the size. It's quantifiable now in a way that makes it kind of exciting. Right? You can also look at how is the topic space used. So this is all the conversation just thrown on to the same uh, topic space grid there. Um, and you can start to see, well, do people tend to start in a particular area of the space? And maybe, I mean, there's something going on here, right? The, the, a lot of people tend to start here, so what's that about? 
Um, it turns out that sports in our population, like, <laughs> I think people are basically trying to find common ground and they're starting with something that hopefully predicts some sort of common ground. Um, we're exploring why uh, people start in certain parts of space and not others. Um, we can start to look at how this differs by whether you're talking to close friends, someone you're attracted to, people with status differences, and uh, all sorts of other things. Right. Um, these are some of the questions that we can ask. We can also see whether the way conversation moves through space is related to how connected we feel, how much we feel like we're clicking with another person. So in Emma's study, what she did was after people had this conversation, they had to go into separate rooms. The two people went in separate rooms. And they had to watch their conversation again from start to finish, which they hated. And they had to dynamically move this slider bar in terms of how connected they felt at every single moment. Right? And so what you get is you get some people that are super aligned. Right? Some, they, they feel like they're connecting in the same place. They feel sort of more disconnected in the same parts. They're, they're tracking each other really well. So there are, these people are aligned, these people are misaligned, which is interesting, right? I mean, it's a measure in, of social intelligence in a way. So you get, uh, this person thinks, ah, oh, yeah, we're totally clicking. This person does not agree, right? <laughs> That's interesting. All right, and you can color the conversation. You can take the topic modeling maps, and you can color them by how connected people feel at different moments. So uh, this, is, this is the same, look at the geometry. It's the same conversation but now colored by how, how well connected people, speaker two felt to speaker one and vice versa. And you can see that in some parts of the space, they, just, they both agree this is not going well. And these, this part of the space, they agree this is really, this, and this is where they're misaligned. Right? This person thinks this is a great part of the space, let's keep going, this person wants out. Um, right. So basically, the, there are lots, lots of advantages of this approach. Uh, no human coders, although you still need to make human decisions. Um, uh, it's a way to represent the data in a multivariate dynamic way and create a framework that you can compare across data sets in different contexts. And this is, um, I think, a big advance over what we were doing before. Right? We can start to really explore how conversation moves as a map. All right. This is much a briefer part of the talk, and then I'll end. Um, because Again, we have like no data, but I'll show you what we're doing. So what we want to look at is whether you can see the magic of this sort of micro mutual adaptation happening um, in terms of brain data. Right. All right. Now, anytime you're talking about social interaction with brain data, it's like the worst possible thing you could think to do in terms of being a scientist, I think. Because you've got, these are your tools, right? You're stuffing someone. Supine, supine in a noisy tube in the dark, telling them not to move, because even two millimeters is going to screw up the data, and we're up to throw it out, so don't move. You tape them in, you, you pack stuff around them. Um, if, you know, EEG, you're just sort of tethered to all these electrodes, and you're also not supposed to blink or clench or muscle, whatever. It's really challenging to do robust social interaction in the context of neuroimaging. All right, so the big question is, why even bother? Right, why not just do behavior, like natural behavioral stuff? And so here's my why bother part of the talk. I'm going to ask you to do something for me. I'm going to put an object on the screen. I want you to name it as fast as you can. That's it, out loud as a group. OK? As fast as you can. OK. That was like a, a second. But on average, if people are doing this in a, you know, a cubicle in there, this is their task, they're about, it's about 600 milliseconds to name something like a tomato. What's interesting is that gaps between turns in conversation are a fraction of that. So that's just naming an object. How much more complex is conversation? And yet we can come in just almost immediately. And actually, Emma has some uh, data now. This is, uh, this is 200 milliseconds is like, what like strangers do. Friends, it's almost zero lag. Right? And so it has to be that social interaction is negotiated as predictive codes. It's the only way it works. I have to somehow form a mental map of what your, how your mind is moving and, and track that. And in fact, we have to kind of form a collective mental map. right? And I need to sort of predict where you're going, and you're predicting where I'm going. Um, and it has to be negotiated this way. And the better the predictions, the greater the fluency. All right, so 
let's see if we can look under the hood and see these predictive codes. And this is work I'm doing with Adam um, and Uri, um, and Chris is also involved, uh, where you've got like, you've got, uh, we've worked all this out. This took a year and a half to work out a way that people can have actual conversation with each other in two different magnets where you don't have the motion artifact problem and you can actually hear and talk in a normal volume. It's challenging. We've worked it out, so if you're interested in doing this, happy to share uh, the parameters of how to do it. Um, you, just, you just need a magnet and a collaborator with a magnet. I mean, even if the magnets are in the same imaging suite, it's still an internet hookup, right? Unless you're pushing people into the bore together, which is weird, don't do that. Um, I know it's, you, some people do that, but this is better. Um, and it's, uh, we did it successfully with someone lying in the magnet at Harvard, someone lying in the magnet at Dartmouth. And here's, um, what we have is, because com free floating conversation is too challenging to uh, really wrangle into a data analysis, we've got a conversation kind of task. So bear with me, this is a starting point. Um, here's the, the task is, person A starts talking about, uh, starts, uh, telling a story. So you give people a prompt, like a kid gets into trouble, and then person A has to start talking. Billy is a kid, and he's walking down the street, and he's going to school, but he comes across a stray dog. And then after 30 seconds, it turns to the next person. They have to, okay, the dog is a golden retriever, and Billy's always wanted a golden retriever, and, uh, and it goes back and forth, and back and forth, and back and forth. So you're building, you're, you're building together, you're co-creating together and adapting to each other's mental map. And this is what it sounds like. And they see where the spaceship just landed. They're really excited, but they're really nervous. They're kind of hiding behind the bushes. And uh, suddenly the door opens. And outside the door is uh, uh, Michael Jackson. <laughs> 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 so one, as soon as a huge Michael Jackson fan, so he just by joy and breaks the cover and starts running towards Michael Jackson. But as soon as in the post, the figure that he once thought was Michael Jackson suddenly sh uh, shifts form and turns into new. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So in this particular story, they're building this thing to this mental map together of like they're putting basically players in the field. Like Michael Jackson now has to be a player in their mental map. Wasn't before, but now he's there and we have to interact and move these sort of concepts around the board together. And we're creating this uh, together with two minds. Um, there's also a, a non-interactive control just so you know that we can do science correctly where if someone's building their own story, another person uh, there's turn taking, but you're just building your own parallel s story that's distinct. Um, so if you have questions about how we control for things, happy to answer them. But basically, uh, what we're looking for is a way to think about how people use conversation to build a completely new space that is uh, together. So it's sort of an emergent mental map across minds. And um, right now, Chris, Adam, uh, are, are using various approaches to try to work through the math of how you would look for these sort of across brain patterns. How you'd predict one mental state, one person's mental state from, you know, person, uh, the other person's mental state. How you would look at information flow, um, how you would, if you could stack both of the brains together um, as one sort of uber brain, do you get a better model uh, that would predict the actual topic geometry in the conversation that they're creating than if you look at them separately and so forth. But this is like seriously hard work in progress. We're working uh, with the Santa Fe Institute with this sort of thing. It's not well worked out. If anybody has any thoughts on what we could try or what, what sort of um, applied mathematical approaches would be interesting, I'm all ears. Uh, in summary, um, I think that this is an exciting time to start looking at dynamic social behavior as it unfolds in space and time in a way that really is about interacting with each other. Um, social psychology and social neuroscience, my fields that I love, have been for too long about people in cubicles one at a time. Let's get more social 
in our psychology and neuroscience and get back a bit to ideas of Kurt Lewin and Stanley Milgram, which were all about how the social situation influences us and, the, um, and that it's weird to think about people as isolated units that don't, in fact, create their thought patterns in concert with other minds. Right? We collectively think, and we've been missing that from our neuroscience. Right? Um, this, is, this was actually taken, I believe, from MIND last year. MIND one. MIND 1, OK. But this is how we do science. right? We get the smartest people we can in a room. We brainstorm. Um, we do everything collectively. We hash things out. And then we, you know, we create things that look like that. Right? Designing a study is a social enterprise. And then we weirdly, the product of that, weirdly enough, is something that looks completely different. Right? Um, so, people are social. We interact to create, coordinate, share information, ideas, emotion. We have no, almost no understanding of how this works. But now, increasingly, we have the tools to dynamically map social thought and behavior in concert with our brains, in fact, dynamically map social thought and behavior. And a deep understanding of human nature is going to require this move. Thank you. I don't have any well-being data. I don't know, Carolyn, if you do, on how the connectivity relates to well-being, or whether that's. Okay. Um, talk because we work with the business school population, where the. <laughs> The business school is, in fact, pretty good at tracking where the, their alums end up, right? Um, because they're donors, essentially, future donors. Um, and so one thought uh, that we've had is to see whether or not um, the social influence metrics, in fact, predict something like later income or some, some metric of impact in the world. Um, you know, it's hard to know how to define that exactly. Yeah, I think this is just a completely thought about it. Um, we still got a really broad and you know, some are also doing more appealing, you know, the central one and so forth, but we still feel that people occupy different spots because it's good for them. Or yes. Or they fit their personality. So now yeah. Yeah, and I'd like to map um, sort of personality dimensions onto sort of social network metrics. Um, and yeah, because I don't, I'm an introvert, for example, and I don't want to be well connected, well connected. Really, I mean, I just, I don't want to be the person that has eight conversations in a room. I just, it's not, I'm not, I don't ever want to be that person, for better or worse. There's nothing wrong with being that person, but that's just not something that I will ever want to do. Um, and, and I think it takes a village, right? So the, the social world is an ecosystem, and you need people that have various strengths. Not everybody can be a hub. That wouldn't make any sense. There's got to be a case where if you threw, I, I sort of fantasize about throwing like eight hubs from various networks on the to sort of a desert island. And like seeing like who then become, you know, how people become less hubby or more, like is it the case that people just, the pressures that are in a social network optimize such that the number, the proportion of brokers and hubs actually stays quite stable regardless of who you throw into the network because people will find that sort of optimal ratio um, and sort of adapt their behavior on the margins accordingly. Yeah.
can I just make this analogy? It would be kind of just five people each of them has two hundred connections. Right. So their DNA server is good. Yes, but they're really high quality connections. connections. But I think the idea is when we get to the network we get information. So it's possible to not be popular but have very high IP of decentrality. Right. Whereas if you do centrality with your person you can get Which is something I haven't I don't know if you've looked at that. I haven't looked at that, but it's this idea of super curation in a way. Like because talking to people is metabolically expensive. So in some ways the smartest thing to do, I think, at least for an introvert, would be uh, to reduce the number of people but maximize their connectedness, right? Um, because right, so it's like super curated um, inner circle. Yes. They would look at the structure of the village and they would give it to people with IP of decentrality. That would be a better measure of the success in the long run because if they're embedded in society. And also in the DC rise to power influence was predicted not by the centrality or wealth or power, but IP of decentrality. So it does have real life implications for Nice. But it would be interesting to take the same no, like you have the same number on in terms of eigenvector centrality. Mm -hmm. but you're getting because you're you've got a thousand Facebook friends and you you talk to all of them, right? But they're all varying quality in terms of their centrality, or you're super tight, right? You could have the same number, but very very different, and that'd be cool to look at. Yes. on uh, whether they track each other in terms of yeah. being connected. Yeah, this is uh, potentially, we haven't done it. Um, there's something like uh, Carolyn is gonna talk about a study that we did with um, how similar sort of friends brain activity um, is. And we've thought about like taking um, intro psych tends to be freshmen, um, people in relationships and scanning them and seeing how similar they are and predicting the longevity of their relationship based on the similarity of their brain activity while they're in a relationship. It just seems a little like we're just waiting for people's status update to change. And then, ha, OK, we knew it. You were doomed. Um, but you, there's no reason why you couldn't do something like that and track actual longevity of friendship or whether people who meet in these round robins as strangers like really, really click and then they end up becoming friends. We've talked, Emma, we've talked about looking at that, but I don't think we've thought very carefully about how we would do it, unless I'm re not remembering. Can I take any more? Yeah. Is that? Yeah, go ahead. In the study of the movie clips, um, yes. you could imagine that people's representations of this movie clip would become more similar over time just because maybe it's the second time. Oh, sorry. There's another, there's a control condition. <laughs> yeah. There's a control condition where there is no con intervening conversation. You just see it again. Yeah. But yes, well done. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes. Unique about conversation, nothing. Here's, but here's why I don't think it's a, a, a real distinction. So the, the, the question basically is, if you could just provide an interpretation, like a written interpretation of the movie, and then have people, you know, some people get this interpretation, some people get this other interpretation, scan them again, 
Now through the lens of that interpretation, you'll get the same thing. Absolutely. But that is basically conversation written down. <coughs> Excuse me, written down. Right. Conversation preceded written language. Written language, conversation, the, the, the point of language is conversation. And conversation is, it can get written down. And basically, yes, you can do this thing where uh, I could tell you what the interpretation is or I could write it down for you and give it to you. But the innovation of our species is language, um, not the, the mode that it, we sort of enable it, if that makes sense. Like written language is just language that developed as speaking and then got transferred onto the page. But it, I don't think it's a, so yes, it would absolutely work, but I don't think it then says, well, there's nothing unique about conversation, if that makes sense. Because I think written language is basically conversation written down. So you, but you could do it that way. Um, yeah, we, we haven't done that study. Um, it's interesting. I'm, a, I'm monolingual, so I don't have a great intuition about how it feels to have a conversation in another language that isn't my mother language. So I'm not sure I'm going to answer the question very well, but someone else could maybe jump in as to whether or not it feels as fluent as fluid, you know, this sort of fluency between people that have the same native tongue um, might not be, might, it might predict less feelings of less, uh, being less connected. If you're having to talk in a language that isn't where you feel as fluent, but I, we haven't studied that. English. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think that within English, people feel like there's this like feeling that uh, we speak the same language. We, we you know, um, even within the same language, there's a kind of a metaphor of fluency. Um, but so I, I, I think that would extend to if you don't feel fluent in a language and you're having to have a conversation in this other language, that you might not be able to click in the same way with someone. That might be challenging. Too much cognitive load or something. Thank you.